So for those of you who are sick of the word innovation, you're going to get a little bit more of it, right? Um, but my, the topic that I would like to speak about is, is what are the new types of thinking and the kind of leadership you need for new classes of challenges. Now, what I'd like to start with is a quote that I, I really love. Um, just take, take stock of this. Every system is perfectly designed to, for the results that it gets, right? So if you look at the outcomes that you have, the system could not be better designed to give you the outcomes that you're getting. So now let, a, let us look at some of the outcomes. So here's a global scorecard for, a ta for targets. Now the exact target are, are debatable depending on who you ask, but let's look at the order of magnitude. And 2030, if you, if you think about the issues that are listed out there, is just around the corner, right? And these, if you look at and then ask yourself, what is our real confidence level? I know that a lot of us are working on these issues, but what is our confidence level of actually meeting these? And if you ask around, not too many people will be able to claim in a defensive manner that we are, we are looking good in terms of meeting these challenges, right? And in some of them, we are taking a really bad beating. But the alarming thing about this, this, these targets is not the targets in and of, of themselves, but the degree to which these are integrated. F the kind of food targets that you have implies that you need more water. You can't do either of those without having more energy. And you can't do either of those without emitting more greenhouse gases. So these are actually intertwined issues, and if they were separated, they would be hard un unto themselves, but they become really, really hard when you take them in, 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 uh, in, uh, uh, in combination, okay? Meanwhile, a lot of us are motivated by these issues, and these are really large issues, but the question is, what does it take to move the needle? Not just what was a heroic effort, not the input side of things, but what would it take to really move the needle? And this is a symbol for the time constant. In time, that in a relevant time scale, because a lot of these challenges are not giving us a whole lot of time, right? But it's also worth noting that some of the very, very key aspects that our civilization, the way we've constructed it, and the way we like it to be, rests on, those are runaway problems with what's called positive feedback loops and exponential curves or sudden drop-offs where there, there's a critical point you reach and after that there's no coming back. There's a, it's a tipping point, right? Now, when you have nonlinear problems and if you meet them with linear challenges and this is what we know how to do pretty well, at some point you're gonna get outpaced unless you find ways of chasing that curve. Right? So there's a theoretical gap, and whatever solutions you have, unless they have the characteristics of chasing that curve, for a while you might look good, but ultimately you'll get outpaced. Right? So these challenges are, have some attributes. They're scaled, they're complex, and I'll come to that in a bit. They're urgent, they are nonlinear at times. They're integrated, you can't separate them out neatly, and these are the characteristics of what are called wicked and super wicked challenges. And some of them are critical, which means that a whole lot depends on really getting it, putting that fire out, right? So imagine if your kitchen was on fire, that is not the time to do dishes, right? I have to put the fire out. So some of these things are, are critical in nature that could be run away and we need to arrest them in time but this is one of the biggest issues that unlike a whole lot of other challenges such as if we are fighting a pathogen that, is, that doesn't have a, a vaccine yet, it is us against a pathogen, right? Here, we are culpable in creating the society that we have that these are the outcomes for. So we are, we are the enemy very often. Our institutional structures are not conducive to solving these problems, right? So if we take stock of this, then it, what it also implies is that what it implies in terms of the world order in the future we are moving into is a very different world order, or at least 
is different in the way we perceive the world out in the past in the era in which our dominant institutions and our dominant thinking were created. And yet we are conditioned by those. And it's really, really hard to think outside the frames of what we've been conditioned by, just as humans. So we have implicit belief in what we do, and it's really hard to pull back from that. But meanwhile, there's a need to reframe, right? So my claim is that we, innovation is not an option. It is something that our civilization depends on. And it's not even innovation of the type that we, we know. There are plenty of innovation methodologies. I'll touch upon one of them. But it's an, a different, we have to innovate on innovation itself, right? Because what we are up against is not something we've ever had to do. And that's if we maintain our aspirations of those goals. I'm using the word innovation in a broad way because it gets used in many different ways. My definition is this. It is whatever it takes to outperform the normative methods by a very large margin, whatever it takes. But deliver new outcomes, new paradigms, new ways in which the system will work and essentially take the system in a trajectory which is different from the one we think it's headed down, right? Whatever it takes. It doesn't matter if it's been done before and it's being reframed or repurposed. It doesn't matter if it is new and glitzy. It doesn't matter if it is technology or not. It is whatever it takes, right? And that's what my definition of innovation is and the way I define it, it is not just a methodological aspect. It's not just a technology. Increasingly, I, I'm hoping to convince you that it's a, it's a matter of a mindset and a philosophical stance and if you don't take that stance, half the battle is lost already, right? So, so that's what my definition is. And that implies that if, it is, if we buy that, that what we are up against is not something that we've had to solve before, then in order to, in order to break our own conditioning, we actually have to admit that we are blind in order to see. I love this quote from Alan Kay, right? And I use this in, in constantly reframing my own techniques, et cetera, you get conditioned to, into believing, and there's a lot of, uh, of, of bias in, in one's own conviction, and you kind of need to do this in order to reframe. Now, one of the blindness kinds of ways we have is innovation blindness. I, I come across this all the time, but this is a very filtered crowd, and perhaps this crowd is not innovation blind, but you can bet that a whole lot of our systems on whose, whose behavior we depend on in order to deliver a, a, a desirable and even tolerable future is innovation blind on average, right? And what that means is that, what that means is that the theory of change is not aspiring to break the normative by a large margin. It's settling. It's settling for what is available, right? And this is, these are some of the very, very important ingredients of innovation that any innovator who does it for a living will tell you. You have to have a seemingly impossible goal. If you don't shoot for the moon, it's unlikely that you'll get to the top of a tall building. You need that, right? You need an impossible goal that makes current uh, solutions almost inappropriate so that you have to think hard about what it would be. I'm gonna to touch upon AND and XOR in a bit, but XOR is a, is a term from double E. It means exclusive or. It's either this or that, but not both, right? And in innovation, you're not allowed to say, do you do this or that? You fight to say, I'll do both. So if you see something like this, the engineers, if you ask the guy who doesn't design the, the printed circuit board, how much real estate you want, he'll say about the, roughly the size of that table, right? But this thing has to be small, it has to fit your pocket, it has to be drop dead gorgeous, it has to be $300, shipped by Christmas, ha, like uh, survive all the drop tests, and that's just what it has to do, right? At that point in time, you just figure out how to do it, right? So it's this, you, you don't get to say, oh, I don't want a battery in, the, in, my, in my cell phone, sorry. You have to stuff it in there somehow, right? And, and then it's a quest for not just thought experiments, but something you can deliver on. You ha unless you do, ac it results in action that transforms something and gives you outcomes, it's all moot, right? So here is a, is a standard way in which we 
we are innovation blind. Here's a, here's a, a choice we are faced with every day, right? Every day, short term or long term. And we are humans, and as humans, we exhibit a behavior called, which is called hyperbolic discounting, which is we place much more value on something that is proximal, close in time frame, is right here, than something that is distal in time frame, far away, right? Which means that that lovely dessert in front of us will always win out against our convictions of working out, right? Unless you exert fantastic willpower, right? There's a predilection of that winning. Now, so then we dial back and forth, right? Should we do the short term? Should we do the long term? But the entire frame that we pit one against the other is an incorrect frame. Because there is the short term and there's the long term, and the true opposites of those are short term losses and long term losses. And you can cross them, right? There exist solutions that meet both criteria. And by not entertaining them, you have essentially done an innovation cop out. You've essentially admitted or gone into a, into a position saying we do not, we will never have solutions that meet both criteria. So that's just in a framing in how you do. But by doing this, you have really lit a fire under your own chair innovation wise saying we will have to go back to the drawing board till we deliver on these. And that's part of the game. You have to light a fire under your own chair to deliver on that. Because the act of coming up with really innovative solutions, believe me, is a whole lot cheaper than the implementation part. So figuring out what is the right thing to do is worth tons more than just doing it right, okay? So we do have a lot of innovation methods. Like, the, like every person in the room will probably have one favorite innovation method. I teach another me method as well. I'll talk about two of them. And one of them, I, will, I was in the small community of people that came up with it. And so I feel I, I love it, but I also v I know it's underbelly and I know its limitations. So I, I want to touch upon it because uh, that community that formed it never expected it to become that popular. It's called design thinking. I don't know if you've heard about this, this, this particular method. It's become quite popular. But what is uh, design thinking? It is, came out of the field of design. And design was a very diversified field. You had architecture and product design and, and all different kinds of design, card, automobile design, et cetera, et cetera. But it came to pass that around, I want to say 1999 or so, turn of the century, that for many reasons, part of it was there was a crisis going on in the de design industry, that, that there was a sense that the way designers thought is quite different from the, the dominant fields, economists and engineers and so on. And it's a design, designers think as differently from an engineer as an engineer from an economist and an economist from an anthropologist. So it's just different. And it turns out that that kind of thinking is fairly useful for challenges that are ill-defined and involve human dynamics and involve creativity and involve ways in which to find solutions that are not obvious. And they, it started getting used in many, many different ways. And the business world adopted it and started really leveraging it, right? Because it turned out that if you became human-centered and you put the human at the center of it and took the trouble to interrogate what lies under the iceberg and what are their needs that they don't even know how to articulate. Well, when you, do, when you design a product or a service around that, they would recognize it as something they always needed, but they just didn't know to, how to say it. And the job of the designer is to glean what li lay under the surface and then create a framing that is a little bit of an abstract framing that would drive your strategies, and then being very, very generative, coming up, brainstorming many ideas, and then being, so you've gone divergent, and then you go convergent and pick out only the ones that are, that, are, that are good, and any designer worth their salt will tell you that for one good idea, you need many. You don't fall in love with the first idea you have. You let the ideas duke it out, right? And so what you do is you essentially take different cognitive modes in your brain, the part that is sensitive, the part that is evaluative, the part that knows how to synthesize, the part that knows how to analyze, the part that knows how to think top down, the part that does bottom up, the part that generates 
ideas, the part that is judgmental and bloody-minded, all of that, right? And you separate them out. And you essentially get people to face lock on one kind of thinking so that everybody is on the same page and you can design a process around it. That's design thinking. And it is brilliant in, is this a brilliant process, very elegant, very brilliant, uh, at solving a certain class of issues. It, because of its focus on the human uh, element, it catches the failure modes between the system and the human condition. And believe me, there are lots of failures out there. The number of systems that have been designed without taking the human and the implicit human condition into account is, is rife, right? It, the, the world is surfeit with them. And so if you essentially take the, uh, the, the care to design the journey of the, of the person, you can actually make the system a lot more efficient. Well, here's the problem. It plays at the intersection between the system and the human. It doesn't have the ability to change the larger system itself, right? It takes the eye off the ball of the, the larger system. What do I mean? If you've been given a problem of solving the, the, path, the issue of uh, vulnerable communities in a coastal area somewhere where the dominant source of income is fish, and you go in and use design thinking methodology, you will catch a certain set of things that they have a lot of problems with with, uh, with negotiating prices because the fisher folk have, have a perishable item and the, those prices are dictated to them and they don't know how to store the fish and, and so a lot of it goes in wastage, et cetera. And based on that, you'll come up with a certain set of solutions. But if you take a systems point of view, you might actually spot something different, that there's a massive trophic collapse going on in the entire marine ecosystem right on in, the, in the place that they actually depend on, on. And unless you catch that, it'll all be moot, right? So, so essentially what I'm talking about is this notion of perceptual lens, which means that you see what you're looking for, right? So if four people came into this room, and I'm exaggerating, of course, and one of them was an economist, the other was an anthropologist, the third was a structural engineer, and the fourth was something else, right? I don't know, um, an engineer, a structural engineer, right? Um, they'd see totally different things. One would say, oh, look at the number of nationalities and, and ethnic backgrounds represented. Someone else would say, hmm, uh, pyramidal roof with clear story windows all around. I wonder if this is a seismic zone, right? You just see different things, right? And someone else who's an industrial designer who'd come and say, hmm, need chairs, right? You just see different things. And so if you're, and one of the things I find is that we have very dominant ways of thinking. An economist thinks in economic terms, an engineer thinks, or a technologist thinks in technology terms. A sociologist thinks in social terms. But people who work in the ground at, in community level, they think that's the terms in which they think. Policy people, that's the weapon they use, right? You see the world in those terms, right? So my contention is that even though it's super important to be human-centered, human-centered isn't in the sense that it, you can actually miss the entire forest for the trees if you're not looking broad. And, and what do I mean by that, right? We are good at solving the problems, but when you add scale and complexity and this criticality and the urgency and so on, you've just taken the problem into a different regime. It's not in the same regime as solving a matrix map for a complicated linkage problem or a server-side equation for how do you scale a server or a very pointed policy equation or whatever, right? It is a different order, right? And here is a framework I like a lot by Dave Snowden, which essentially said that you can classify our challenges into four different broad buckets. A simple system is like a self-evident system. So that bottle on, the, on your table is something that you might be able to figure out how to open without any instructions, right? It's self-evident. It's actually a very clever system if you think about it. It's, it has in what's a mechanical engineer would call an over-center mechanism where the, spring, the wire is bending over and that's what keeps the spring force. It's actually a very clever system, but you figure it out, right? But it's unlikely that unless you've had the training, you'd be able to fi fix a Swiss Army wa Swiss watch 
or that camera out there, or a, or a, or a car, because these are extremely complicated systems. But the one aspect of a complicated system is that the subsystems are predictable, which means that what goes in and what goes out, they do that every time, right? Not so with complex systems. Complex systems, the couplings are much looser, and think about it as different elements. Humans, uh, institutional frameworks, infrastructure, social behavior, economic structures, etc. all of these things playing a dance. And each, the behavior of any one is, is actually a re, is a related to the nature of the relationships and the state that something else is in. It's a dance, so it's like a, think about a forest. A forest is not just a bunch of trees, it's a whole set of relationships that makes it a forest. And then there's another state which is called chaotic where something has happened to disturb that, that the, the complicated relationships that kept it in what's called dynamic equilibrium and things are coming apart really, really quickly. Forest fire, right? When you have a forest fire, the degree to which you can, uh, 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 you can actually have any influence on the system is very low compared to the extrinsic forces at play. So you really want to avoid having things go into a chaotic state because things change very, very quickly. It'll stabilize in some other form. A forest might become a grassland or it might be a whole bed of ash. It'll stabilize somewhere, but not in the direction you might desire. Turns out that our dominant ways of thinking is in the complicated zone. And we bring that thinking into, into the complex realm and just wish it, trying to wish it into a complicated state. Wish that, hey, those rules would apply here. Turns out, the moment you take scale and complexity and so on, they have no respect for our disciplinary boundaries. They are complex, right? So you need to use some lot different thinking and the decision-making frames, et cetera, are different, right? Now let's take a look at this. This is the, the sustainable development goals. I bet all of you have seen this before. This is such a colorful, happy graphic, right? It's the world getting an F grade. Right? It reminds me of my English teacher who would come and give me a big smile and give me a low grade on my essay. Right? It's a really, we are getting a crummy grade. Now, all our governments, all the UN, I'm in conversation with the UN and the World Economic Forum about the processes being used. All the governments are working in silos and they're blinkered. I'm gonna solve, that department is gonna solve education and that other person is gonna solve health, et cetera. Deeply interrelated issues. If you look at it that way, you will, not, you will be putting band-aids on a system where you could actually go and find clever little, like a really pointed ne nexus in the system behavior where a little bit of effort would get you a whole lot. It's the interconnectedness that makes our current approaches very inappropriate and really makes our confidence level in actually meeting those goals, which are incontrovertibly important the confidence level is really brought down to its knees, right? So what do we do, right? We have to have some actions. And some, a gentleman, before I, f I forget his name, I don't know if I see him there, mentioned this today. Systemic challenges need to be met with systemic solutions. Um, and scale challenges have to be made with, met with scale ch uh, solutions. Otherwise, you're pretending that the, uh, the solution the problem is a different class from the one uh, that it really is, or you're being motivated by the scale of the problem, but you're not really being able to influence it at scale collectively, not necessarily individually, right? So here's another kind of blindness that we have. If you bring the, word, the deterministic and positivistic thinking that we are all very good at because that's how our education systems trained us to be very, very good at, and that's the road that Descartes sent us down, right, then we tend to have a perceptual lens that is a little weak at systems blindness. And it's a little ironic because half the room is our, our policymakers who do this for in their sleep, right? So I'm speaking to, a, to, to uh, you know, the converted in some senses. But the theory of change has to be based on a systems theory, whether it is substantiated by data or not, it has to be, right? And you can't be scale blind. You have to have a theory of scale. And scale is a very, very nuanced issue. There's scale and there's scaling. There are many dimensions of scale. 
What is it that you're trying to scale? What are the, the proxies for, for success around scaling? It's a very complex and nuanced issue, but we meet it with very, very crude mechanisms and crude numbers, right? But scale is very intricately tied with time. You cannot separate these two. Because if you had unlimited resources and unlimited time, eventually you can scale. But implicit in scale is time and resources, right? You are trying to hit a target, but what, how much time are you giving me? How much resources are you giving me? What are the means I have to have? With what efficacy are you, are you telling me that I have to hit the target? So time is baked in. And the time constant, what resilience theory tells us that everything has a natural frequency and a natural time, time constant. The rate at which your cells divide in your body all the way to supernovae and how, how, how many billions of years the, uh, the, the uh, 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 stellar object will, will live, everything. Institutions have a certain time constant. The notion of law, the notion of dem democracy, et cetera, have a much longer time period. Norms have longer time periods. An organization can have a certain life, life period. Everything has time constants, but there are ways in which to muck with it. There are ways to, in which you can intervene and change the time constants. There are time constant multipliers. There are scale multipliers. Those are the principles we need to grasp in order to intervene with these challenges that are not easy, right? So the other thing is nonlinearity. This is not a ball that we can take our eyes off of. Because so often we have a bias towards how much, how much we are doing that we frame it in terms of our efforts and, and we pat ourselves on the back. And we should, you know, that, that you know, celebrating our ach achievements is a very good thing to do and gives us optimism and all that, very good. Accepting that we really need to understand that nonlinear problems need to be met with solutions that have at least the theoretical capability of nonlinearity. And there are certain things that we know do that. Really clever market systems, level behavior change systems, platform architectures, technologies that are nonlinear are always, many other things are all ways in which we can influence whether we are stuck in the normal time constant or we can multiply it, right? So systems approach is actually looking at the systems dynamics. It basically says, Anything is a system. Uh, a family table conversation um, with your extended family is a system. And the way I'm making my decisions about how I'm passing my time in the day is a system. And so, is, so are the grand, big, huge things that give us the outcomes which, which are desirable or not. But it's a lens that we bring, right? It's a perceptual lens. It's a term by a, 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 a philosopher called Igor Brunswick. Um, and what we are doing is, is how do we, it, so it's not just a systems lens because you can take a systems view and without the intentionality that goes with it. This is not just about technically taking a systems view and whether you've done, studied the systems dynamics. It's about what do you care about? What do you wanna shoot for? And what is your philosophy and how do you construe success and what is your ontology? How do you construe your truth, right? So we have a very, very messy system. And so the notion is that can you do what I call system acupuncture, right? The notion is that you will never have the, the trillions of dollars and you'll not have the institutional support to take it on in brute force method. So can you construe of ways in which you can put a few interventions, but so judiciously placed such that there's a synergistic aspect to it and the system behavior change changes. But you don't make parse it saying, oh, that's, an that's a social system and that's an economic system, et cetera. You look at it in combination. Now, is that easy to do? Absolutely not, which means we need tools and we need some, some skills, et cetera, which can be done. Now, many techniques out there um, my, my community, the people I work with, have we've been coming up with a technique of our own called system acupuncture, and it bakes in some of the things I'm talking about, but 
it's a theory and a framework and a, and a set of processes that make it easy. So you don't have to learn, go, go and learn the theory. You can actually start practicing it because this is very, very impact-minded. This is not an academic uh, endeavor. I'm still a little bit in denial of the fact that I'm in academia. I'm all about trying to you know, make impact. And so a lot of the frameworks, and what it does is it brings in this, the good parts of design thinking and, and systems thinking, but with an architecture on scale. And there's a way in which you look at scale and a little more nuance about how you look at the issues of scale and what are skin, scale inhibitors, what are scale uh, uh, amplifiers, and what is just scale fulfillment and what is scale amplification. You essentially look at it in different ways. And then we borrow very, we innovators steal very heavily, right? We have no shame about stealing. So we steal a lot from other theories. So we steal from resilience theory, uh, the theory of leverage points. We steal from theory of economic complexity that says that in order to, in order to get a larger uh, emergence of economic activity going, you actually create multiple parts and create the interstices. And the more complex it is, the more things that will grow in the interstices. So you actually build a strategy around that. Um, and then, this is something I, I am very keen about. Because if you really stop to think about it, a lot of our problems are behavioral issues. The fact that we are 7 point something billion, 7.4 billion going on to 9 billion dollar people is a, on a podunk little planet is a behavioral issue. The fact that if somebody sees a $20 bill lying on the, on the ground, they will pick it up is economics. It's a behavioral field in some senses, right? But all of that is nice and academic, but the behavioral fields, cognitive psychology, social uh, psychology, behavior, behavioral economics, et cetera, now are providing tools not just to observe behavior, but to actually modify behavior, which of course the marketing world has done forever, forever and ever. I don't think either any of us would have used toothpaste if it wasn't for marketing. It was a completely new construct, you know, a few century, a century ago, right? So, what we do is we take behavioral principles and we say there is such a thing as, as if you can modify behavior, then behavior is a technology. Indistinguishable from any other technology. What it bits and, and uh, chips and uh, being able to process metal is not what makes a technology a technology. What makes a technology a technology is do you have the methods by which to create predictable results, right? That's what makes it a technology. So if behavior is something you can influence, imagine what you could do on the demand side of the equation, not just the supply side of the equation. Think about what you could do with energy if you could actually modify the behavioral side of the equation and not just supply. And before you laugh at me and say, oh yeah, like, you know, dream on, Banny, right? Think about this, the average per capita energy consumption of Denmark is half that of the US. But then you'll say, what about their GDP? Well, the GDP per oil, oil kilogram of oil equivalent is twice that of the US, right? And where is the difference? In the way in which the infrastructure is created, the policy was created, and behavioral aspects. So I was once in Edinburgh for the TED Global thing, and it was raining like crazy in Edinburgh. And I was in a bus, and the, here's a guy who walks into the bus. Well, it, it would help to have this guy be six foot five, but he came in with a, with a bicycle. And I said, you're from Denmark, aren't you? And he says, how could you tell? <laughs> right? So I said, well, like, I know that you're not an Englishman, right? Like, which country would you have a guy in, like, pouring rain? And he, and he was mystified. He's saying, why aren't more people on bikes? I'm saying, have you seen the weather? He said, what has that got to do with anything? <laughs> so, so it's, behavior is a very, very big thing, right? Um, and then you can actually look at business strategy. You can look at market models. You can look at technology, but look at technology not as traditional technologists do, but find new meaning in how you can spin it. Because technology is used in very crude ways. Technologists are not the best people to shape what technology should do, right? They understand what, what it takes to create the technology 
they're not the best, they don't have the best record to, to really understand the kind of forces that they're gonna unleash on the world. So you actually figure out, you construe technology, you work very closely with people who are very, very, very good at technology and, and you push them even harder, but you construe it in different ways. But there is ways, there are tools by which you, you create combinatorial strategies. But then you don't just settle for single outcomes. If you're going for single outcomes, it means you're working very much at the distal end of the system. You might actually look at upstream in the causal chains and say, what can we do such that many things are being served elegantly? And it's just a methodological difference, right? And I know a lot of you will say, oh, unless you have laser-like focus, you won't get it and so on. Well, we've had laser-like focus and look at the outcomes you're getting, right? So what we are after is new behaviors, new relationships in the system elements, new paradigms, I'll come to paradigms in a bit, new platforms, because platform architectures have a way in which to use network effects and many, many different motivations in order to create, uh, to essentially tackle scale. Just think Airbnb and think Uber and think of how little it took to take on established markets. There's something, uh, like deep down within, in, if you do platform thinking, that is actually quite elegant, can be elegant. Um, but you're after completely new kinds of outcomes, but because systems thinking are not the kind where you push the car over the hill and it'll just reach uh, the end on the winding street without any navigation, and this particular hill that the, the car is going down happens to end in a cliff, and if you don't navigate uh, during the way, you might well drive off the cliff. That's what we've done as a civilization. So it means that as you're creating the system, you're also having to create the capacities in the people to navigate that because that's what systems thinking tells us, that you actually have to very, have very tight feedback loops between your propositions and sensing whether it's actually working out right or not. And, and you're after new tr system trajectories, not just outcomes in one slice of time. You're actually looking at how can we change the behavior of the system, right? Now, I use the word paradigm. I use this graph from uh, Govind Rajan's work and uh, Richard Pascal's work, which is essentially a 100-year history of high jump, right? Four different styles, right? We've gone through scissors, western roll, straddle, and fast reflux, right? Interesting thing is that every time the style changed, the human body was able to do something different. Right? But the most important point about this is that the number of people who are practicing for the next Olympics using the scissors kick is exactly zero. Right? The rule books have been rewritten. Meanwhile, 100 years ago, every athlete who was in the, in the sport was practicing hours on end on scissors kick. Right? But the even more important point was that if you're a scissors kick person, you think in terms of scissors kick. And the Fosbury flop would look like utter madness, right? You're going all, all over the pole with, you know, your back to the pole, your feet are the last thing that clear, you're falling on your head, you don't have the technology yet to break your fall, or you're falling on sand, it's all wrong, right? And yet, right? And also, backstory, Dick Fosbury, cleared this and, and in the Mexico Olympics and won the world record, and he didn't let on that he was gonna do it because he would have been stopped. He just did it and said QED, I've cleared it, right? So now you don't have to, uh, the precondition that you're actually going to convince someone and, and get them to understand what you're gonna do and that is a precondition and everybody's gonna agree is actually a pretty weak theory. The behavioral scientists say that instead of first changing motivation and that'll change behavior, change behavior first and then you'll see the motivation changing, right? So there are, you actually have ways in which to, so this is the kind of thinking we need to do. We need to set the bar impossibly high and say, okay, our current techniques are not gonna get us over the bar, so let's scratch our heads till we find some, right? And we had another meeting this earlier in this room, I don't know how many of you were in that meeting about, about uh, um, carbon dividends, it had all the makings of this kind of thinking. It's thinking really outside the box, right? So what are we fetishistic about if you're doing this? Very scale impact, right? And if you want to change the, you want to transform the behavior of the system in as deep a way as possible, 
nothing superficial is, is allowed to stay on the drawing board, right? So then it begs the question, where do you intervene? How, like, you know, how, what is, are your interventions really systemic or not, right? These are all questions that immediately fall out. How do they propagate? How do they scale, et cetera, right? So we have a very technical term for, for getting into systems. It's called despaghettification, right? So we actually, it turns out that even that, that when if having really, really solid information, but not just data, understanding why you're getting that. A lot of research tells you what, but doesn't tell you why, right? You don't see the causal relationships. You can see a map of this is increasing and that is increasing, but you, uh, system, the quest of despaghettification is not about seeing how, what is the precedence you're having. What you're saying is, why is it happening? What are the causal chains? Why is this behavior causing that behavior? What is this stakeholder doing that is influencing that stakeholder? What is the nature of the relationship like this way and that way? What are the influences? If these are the outcomes, let's work back into what are causing those outcomes and what are causing those outcomes and how the outcomes are in, in potentially feedback loops, which means that A is causing B and B is causing C, but hey, C is causing A. We have a feedback loop. What's the gain rate? Is it really fast? Oh boy, unless we snip one of these things, you know, we cannot solve any of these. You found a nexus in the system or you found a choke point in the system. You found an insidious relationship in the system. You found a run runaway feedback loop. That's how you despaghettify this thing. And if you, I have taken roomfuls of people off in areas that I know nothing about, right? But just got them to fall into a process which is very obvious, it's applied common sense. They do that in, in bringing up their children anyways. And this could be really, really complex, such as the future of the oceans or climate change or what have you. And you would be surprised at a certain kind of view that you get in a day's time, right? It is just a different way of looking. But then what it does is it gives you a way of entering that with a different kind of theory and understanding the system is very, very crucial. But it does not necessarily tell you what to do, right? You do get an understanding and that's very crucially important, but that's just the beginnings of the next part of the journey, which is to innovate solutions that are systems-based. So that's, you need tool for that, right? And what do we tend to do is look at this really complex world through those narrow slits, right? That, those are the narrow disciplinary slits to look at through perceptual lenses that are narrow. And that's also very important because it allows us to ask brilliant questions, very pointed questions at the base of the silo, which we are inordinately good at, but we're not particularly good at stitching across silos, are we, right? Right now, I'm at Stanford, considered one of the most integrative and, and uh, collaborative uh, campuses. Don't tell anyone back at Stanford, but it's really hard to actually go and have a conversation that is meaningful where you can stitch the fields together quickly. It's actually the students who make us do that, right? They are the mean free, uh, the phonons in the system, right? Now, so what I, we do is we take the system behavior and, and draw lens, like put that in the center and put the fields around. And it's not just fields, it's agency types as well. Public sector, private sector, NGOs, this, the, the people who are working on the ground, who are the users, et cetera. But there's a difference between collaboration and co-creation. Collaboration is where your identity is one of your discipline or your industry. And you go in there and say, what does my industry do? What, does my, what do economists do? I'm an economist, I'm gonna play this game. And you, you, know, you work with everybody else. In fact, a cell phone has people who are you know, uh, engineers and, and market, uh, marketing people and sales people and so on and my manufacturing people all who have played ball together, sometimes with large pools of blood, but they have played, the, played ball in order to deliver that thing to you. So that is understood in industry, right? Co-creation looks different. You are working in post-disciplinary identities. You're, you're going beyond what you're using, you're leveraging what you know, but you're defining it in terms of the characteristics of the challenge that your understanding of the, the problem is moving very, very quickly as you're interrogating what the problem is. And the difference is this. 
the possibilities, it's a little bit of an abstract construct, so forgive me, but the possibilities, the range of possibilities when you're doing uh, collaborative is, is uh, there's, a, there's a limit to what you can do, theoretically, but the moment you do co-creation, you can actually create completely new epistemology and solution sets that have never seen, been seen before. They, they're fundamentally different, and that is a possibility. And why is that? Why am I making that claim? And that's because if you look at something complex from different sides and choose to create a parallax, you actually realize what that thing is. Right? So the people on one side are arguing about what the diameter of the circle is because that's the only side they're seeing. And the others are seeing the rectangle. But it's only when you look at the, uh, the different sides you actually see, get a better sense of what it might be. Right? Not necessarily a complete understanding because you never have a complete understanding. Right? So the last bit is, is that we really, really need uh, a new type of leadership. Right? Because we are going from a consumption economy, we have been in a consumption economy, and then we celebrated the experience economy where a company like Apple can outdo Exxon in terms of market cap. And, but we are, whether we like it or not, we are in the midst of a transformation economy where we are either going to be subject to the changes or drive the changes or both, right? And here, production and efficiency was, you know, a simplified way of putting it, where, where the litmus tests, the, the understanding the experiential aspects became more important over and above that. So it was like production and efficiency is taken for granted, and then you had this. And now the system factor is raising its, its, rearing its head and saying that, no, you have to take this into account. And that also means that the nature of leadership is changing. This is leadership that, that delivered ex execution, excellence in education. This is excellence in education plus the innovation that comes with delivering on really rich experiences. And this is the lower two plus understanding how the system works, right? Now, systems leadership is something that is really at a theoretical level. We have a massive gap in. That's not how our governments are working. That's not how our decision makers are working. We really have a gap out there, right? And, but it does require a different mindset, right? So you need altered intentionality frames. You need to be able to envision different futures. You are innovation-minded. You're, you're, you're system-minded, inter integrative, and holistic rather than deterministic. You're scale-minded and very, I call it, patience and patient. Where you want the results now, but you also know that it, there is a journey to it. You have to have process. This is not accidentally, it's too, too much, there's a lot going on and you need to have clever processes and elegant processes. You need to be co-creative. You need to work with different, very many, you need to multiply the resources. And you have to change the norms and the patterns of behavior. And you're facilitating, you're catalyzing action. And these are just some of them, right? And ultimately you're creating an ecosystem. And the ecosystem is this. At the level of the system, there's an ability for it to transform or not. And your job as a system leader, or our job as a system leader, is to change the, the way that the cap capacity to transform and the direction in which it goes. And you need to increase the level of expertise, but also uh, increase the level of scale and complexity in that larger portfolio. So our job is this, to increase it from where it is to a different scale, right? And that's the, that's the playing field. And the quest is a, look, is a quest for an, a certain kind of elegance. It's simplicity on the far side of uh, complexity. Because it's on, if it's on this side, it's simplistic. If it's on that side, it's not necessarily more effort to implement. But it has the, option, the chances of making systemic changes. So we really do want to make, move the needle. So the potency of the intervention matters, the scale of the intervention matters, the speed of deployment matters, and the degree to which they implement it matters. So I have taken more than my allocated share of time, so I don't know if we have any time for questions. So we, I'm told that I have only five minutes for questions. Forgive me, but I'll be around. So any questions? A <clears throat> Professor Banerjee, when you teach systems thinking, um, do you have the students come from all walks across the university like the D school does? 
And do you have them solve a problem or approach a problem where they need to actually apply the kind of thinking that you're requiring? I, I teach multiple classes. And this kind of topic is best uh, done with a pedagogical style, which is called PBL, problem-based learning, as opposed to case-based learning or, or the Socratic way or a atelier model or other models. And what that means is in my classes, I have four different dimensions of reality. It is a real problem, incontrovertibly real, not a ball rolling down a slope or some such thing. It has a real context. It's playing out in Africa or somewhere. It is scaled, right? It, is, it has a real partner involved, so I partner with someone who's working on that issue. And if the students do a good job, it'll be deployed. And there's a chance that they can actually make impact. And it, it's real for the students and it's real for the partners. And they use techniques and, and a very short period of time. And if you, like these, these students at Stanford, even though we have 10 weeks in a quarter with them, they're taking four other classes, right? So they have like their time and they're playing, you know, uh, they have to worry about their Frisbee game and their, and, their, and their hot dates. So I have a certain fraction of their mind share, but even during that, that time, it's remarkable what, what you can do and, and how much you can shift in, in the kind of pro propositions you can create and, the, and the, the theoretical value and the scalability, et cetera. Yes. Can you speak way up? Wait, there's a microphone coming at you. DL, are there specific leaders or organizations who are deploying this type of leadership that you would have us look to for inspiration? You asked me a tough question because I'm looking for cases as well. But one institution that is taking this on in a big way is the World Economic Forum. And I'm actually working very closely with them. I'm, I'm on the Global Futures Council for Systems and Platforms. But they had their a long study uh, for, for a while because before the SDGs, they have their own systems initiatives which are big, like energy and food uh, security and consumption and cities and big ones. And they came to a conclusion that the next generation of leadership needs to be called systems leadership. I had no idea about that and I came to that point, point of view independently. But now I'm working with them. And so they are essentially, uh, uh, essentially figuring out how to incorporate that and institutionalize and spread it very, very quickly because they see the theoretical kind of uh, risk of not having it. Can, can we have a microphone there? Um, so, so you're at Stanford University and, and a lot of the, the work is defined by the disciplines. Um, the kind of problem-based work that you are identifying is not typical either in undergraduate or graduate programs. In any education. In field. any education. Yeah. And so um, if we're gonna think about developing the leaders, and yet they're coming through your institution, the leaders of the future. Yeah. So how do you think about change at your institution that aligns with what you're speaking about? So uh, I'm very subversive. And I, and I, uh, I'm not, uh, I like to, uh, you've seen me. I'm, I'm, my, part of my role is that of an agent provocateur and I like to kick conceptual shins. Um, and so I do that with Stanford as well. So I am not inside the culture, I'm counterculture. And I take the risk for that. They might throw me out any day, any day and I have, like I, politically I swim upstream all the time. But I have one life to lead and it's, it's what they call a zero X zero game. You're born with nothing and you die with nothing and there's an X in the middle. And this is what, you know, I have a secret that, you know, Oh, I shouldn't tell you that secret because the secret is that you negotiate hard for the job, but you do it for free. But don't tell that to Stanford, right? But, but this is what makes sense to me, and the way I do it is by being, and it actually comes from organizational theory as well, which is that you create a counterculture which is on the edge of the organization that essentially has a way in which to reach out to other cultures but has a way in which to influence and replicate itself within our culture. So things are moving. In fact, I'm in conversation with, with uh, the World Economic Forum and Stanford in order to create a systems, uh, systems uh, transformation institute 
off the record, it's not firm or any such thing. It's like uh, we are exploring it. But this, the conditions would not be okay for it 10 years ago, right? It's too combinatorial and it would make all the researchers very, very uncomfortable and it still does. Last question or are we out of time? Last right. question, yes. So just in translating the ideas into some pragmatic steps, perhaps we can adapt. Is it the makeup of teams? Is it, you know, how do you know as a leader along the way, bridging the work from, as you said, collaboration to co-creation, are there practical steps you would encourage us to consider? To there are that? very, very practical and pragmatic steps that are also coupled with some mindset shift. You can actually follow the steps and get it wrong, but you could have the, mi the mindset but not follow the steps, so it's a combination, but they're very pragmatic steps. But first and foremost, uh, there is the deep end of the theory and the deep end of the practice and so on, but the way to get into it is the threshold is very low. Systems mapping is not hard. I could teach it to you in half an hour, right? Parts of it. Uh, so it's the, the access to it is very low and learning it is very easy, but you're essentially not, it's not a solo work. So you're essentially taking on, uh, you're, you're creating a project which looks like a little bit of a sawtooth, right? And you say, okay, there's a base level work that's going on, but then you have a, a place where you can bring a whole lot of people together, and because everybody is, has, is, is impoverished in the cu currency of time, you have to get them in for a day or two or three, whatever you can grab them for, but then you essentially take them through the things where they can co-create something which is far greater than you can do, get months of work done in that time, and there are techniques for doing that. So you actually, essentially what you do is you take stock of, before even looking at what is available to you, saying what are we trying to do? Let's imagine a future that's different, and let's say what does the future system, and it's irrespective of how we get there, what is the functioning of the system look like? Then you say, okay, now let's map the system with what we know, or at least ask the questions so that we can go find, but let's map the system in terms of its relationships and the causal chains. Now that we do it, let's figure out where we can, we can intervene which will have the most amount of effect. What is pivotal? What is uh, bedrock? What is critical, right? And you essentially have a rubric by which to say these are insertion points. Then you evaluate those insertion points in terms of scale, in terms of resource, uh, resource aspects, in terms of re realizability in practical aspects and so on. So now you have some contenders. Now you say, okay, now we create solutions and, and system solutions. And then you say, okay, now how do we get them down to the ground and create a roadmap? So it's an arc, right? But it's, it's not that hard to do. So I'm told I'm out of time. So glad to uh, chat later, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you.